Welcome to the Science Podcast for February 22nd, 2019. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, we go to the AAAS annual meeting in Washington, D.C., and I talk with Kathy Binger about using technology to help kids with communication disorders. And despite what you may have heard, at this point, iPads and the internet have not solved all the problems. I also talked with freelancer Sarah Scholes about using satellites and artificial intelligence to spot modern day slavery from space. And Valerie Thompson is back for this month's book segment. She talks with author Judy Grizel about her book, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. I'm at the AAAS meeting in Washington, D.C. Today we're talking with Kathy Binger about using technology to help people with impaired communication. Hi, Kathy. Hi, how are you, Sarah? I'm really good. And this is such an interesting topic because I think when you say using technology to help with communication, people are going to think, oh, the internet or mobile phones. Those are things that help you with communication. And it's true that these kinds of technologies have helped people, but they're not the magic bullet. And in your session, you know, you talked a lot about the complexities of helping people with communication disorders. So what kind of communication problems do you work with? I personally work with young children who have communication problems, so they can have any of a range, a very wide range of communication issues. It can be children with cerebral palsy who also have motor impairments. It can be children with Down syndrome or any of a number of other syndromes that cause speech impairment or have speech impairments associated with them. Or it can be with very young children, often we don't know what's really going on. The story that you'll often see in a newspaper, for example, would be they show a picture of a kid with an iPad and this kid wasn't talking and then the iPad came home with the parents, some app they bought, and now the kid is talking. Unfortunately, that's not how that works. Can you talk a little bit about some of the complexities that come into things? We can boil some of the complexities down into three tips for communication. So we have the T and the T is for technology and that is and can be a very important piece. But we also have an I in tips, which stands for instruction. So we need instruction both for the child and also for the people who communicate with the child, so educators and families, et cetera. And then we have the P, which is for personalization. And all throughout the process, including the technology, including the instruction, needs to be personalized to meet the very individualized needs of each child. I think a really good example that came up amongst the different speakers was you work with kids. A lot of these apps or these screens have icons or symbols on them because the kids aren't reading. But someone who is an adult that already has an experience with reading, they might rely on letters and spelling. And so this personalization, it absolutely has to happen depending on who the patient is. Right. It would be fantastic if we could teach two and three year olds how to read. And then that would really solve the problem because all they would need in English, at least, would be 26 letters and off they go. But that's not how it works. Lots of our kids are very young and they certainly need to communicate when they're very, very young. Um, we also have children who have cognitive impairments, intellectual impairments, who are going to be delayed with their reading. Um, and so we can't wait until kids can type letters in order to help them communicate. So we need to look at other ways to help them while we're really pushing for and supporting early literacy skills. Um, so we do want to push early literacy, but of course that's not going to happen for every child at a young age. This came up, I think, with you and another speaker. You're not just getting these kids or these adults to communicate their most basic needs. You also want them to develop language skills and you also want them to communicate with people, like commune, that part of it, like right. actually be in a, a relationship with a person using language. There's some data that's been out for a really long time now, multiple decades, that shows that young children up to age five, you might think that what they're mostly doing is requesting things. And that tends to be the kind of stuff that we give kids access to, right? Like, I want juice, I want crackers. But in fact, this old research shows that less than 20% of children's early communications are really focused on requesting. They're commenting, they're showing you things. They learn to say, you know, social words and greetings. And communication is so rich, even for very, very young children, even before children who are typically developing learn to talk. They're pointing things out and commenting and all of that. So we need to make sure we're giving children access to a full range of communication opportunities. You know, when my daughter was born, we got on the train and started to do a little sign language with her. And that is something that would be frowned upon maybe a decade ago. People thought if you teach your kids sign language, 
they're not going to learn speech. Of course, that's not true. And I feel like this is also something that came up in your talk today with, you know, using technology. Absolutely. And of course, sign language is part of augmentative communication. It's taken a while, but we now have a good body of research that's growing that shows not only that using technology won't prevent speech from developing, but we have some new findings coming out, including randomized controlled trials showing that it can actually help children and speed up their communication. And that's something, those of us who work clinically, we've known that, you know, seen that for many years, but the research is starting to catch up to that and we're starting to have some good data to back that up. So it's an understandable fear that parents have that children are not going to communicate or they're not going to want to talk if they're using this technology. That just doesn't happen. One of the beautiful things about using technology to communicate is when they get that speech signal, every time they hear a word, every time they hear the word I or am or house or whatever, they hear it exactly the same way. And if they're a child who has problems processing language, getting that speech signal in in the same way every time may be helping them. Now, when we talk about a child looking at a grid of symbols or pointing to something or using the speech coming out of a technological device. We're not talking about a specific app. There is no miracle app to get your kid to talk. Instead, it's got to be a suite of tools. I think it's really important to get the message across that it's not a matter of us waiting for a magic app to be developed. People have been waiting for that and working on that for a long time, and I think it's the wrong question. The question is, what does this child need, given this child's whole array of factors, including their personal factors, right? What their cognitive level is, what their speech level is, what their motor abilities are, et cetera. And then what their broader environmental picture is like. There are things that work, but you're gonna have to kind of pull from all these different areas to serve one kid's needs. Right. We do something that we've been doing for the past several decades now called feature matching. We look at the child and look at the child's characteristics and look at the family and all of the complexities that come along with that child. And what we want to do is we want to look at what not only apps, but also other types of AAC devices that are out there. It might not be an iPad that works and figure out what kinds of things do we need to do to fill in their communication needs based on this particular child. So it could be doing some sign language along with a high tech communication app, along with something that's low tech for when that communication app breaks down because it is going to break down at some point and we need to make sure that child has access to communication. You know, a lot of these things are iPads. They're, they're something that anybody would recognize. And has that helped get this into the hands of kids that maybe their parents wouldn't want them to use technology instead of just focusing on speech? Absolutely. That's been a huge game changer. We've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. They were just very small companies by and large um, with highly, highly specialized devices. Once the iPad came out, I actually looked it up yesterday, the first full-blown iPad app for communication came out 10 years ago. We've all been going through this sea change in my world, in my discipline about how to handle all of that. There are both things that have been huge blessings and things that have been drawbacks. The huge blessings have been the normalizing piece where, you know, my kids now look like every other kid and they get to be the cool kids sometimes because they get to have their iPad when other kids are not allowed to have their iPad. So that's fun. Like they get to be the kid that other kids want to be with, which is not something that often happens for the children I work with. And then there are some challenges too, where again, you know, lots of families, they see something on TV or YouTube or wherever, a Twitter feed, and they go out and buy something without getting an assessment. And that's where the trouble really comes in um, because that may not be the best tool for them. It might not be the best hardware. It might not be the best software. And they maybe they just blew $700 for nothing that they could have put towards something else that's going to be more appropriate for the child. So it's that undoing of that process is, is the challenging piece right now. But there have been many blessings with the changing technology as well. Okay, Kathy, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Kathy Binger is an associate professor at the University of New Mexico. You can find a link to her session and her laboratory website at sciencemag.org slash podcast. Stay tuned for an interview with freelance science journalist Sarah Scholes about using satellites to spot modern day slavery. We can see a lot from space these days. The resolution of satellite imagery lets us see things like roads, buildings, even people. 
though those tend to be pretty low definition, you know, about three pixels per person. Freelance science journalist Sarah Scholes is here to talk about spotting something a little different, seeing slavery with satellites. Hi, Sarah. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, sure. So the first question I have, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is what does slavery look like from space? The biggest example that researchers have so far involves looking for brick kilns, which are these very large structures that are kind of oval shaped where people make bricks. And researchers know from intelligence on the ground that these use a high proportion of forced labor and slave labor. And they're easy to spot from space because they're big and ovular. Where are those located on the face of the earth? They're located in a region conveniently called the Brick Belt, which is in South Asia. It spans a number of countries. Researchers involved in this work are also using satellites from the European Space Agency, and they're actually looking in other wavelengths, not you know, things that are visible to the eye, but for other kinds of frequencies. What can they find using that system? Yeah, using a satellite called Sentinel-2, which sees frequencies that your eyes can't detect, researchers can actually tell what kinds of minerals are on the surface of the earth. And so they can differentiate different kinds of mining. And they know that certain types of mining are um, using lots of slave labor. Then there's another kind of satellite that uses radar. So kind of sends microwaves at the ground, bounces them back and detects how they've changed. And that kind of intelligence can actually show mining tunnels where people are working because the ground subsides a little bit beneath them. Wow. One last thing that you mentioned briefly in your story, you didn't really elaborate on, but I did remember hearing a podcast on this, and that's using ship tracking to own in on slavery. How does that work? So researchers know where ships should be going and where they shouldn't be going. And when they detect from looking at these ships from space that they are turning off their trackers and going places they shouldn't go, that's suspicious illegal activity that might be connected to slavery. And they can also see ships kind of lining up with other ships, docking with them essentially and transferring, you know, illegal cargo or people who they're treating illegally. Right. Well, One thing I noticed about these different methods is they all rely on a lot of information about how these things work. It's not just taking pictures, it's figuring out what these pictures mean. So how how are they working together with the people who know that slavery looks like a brick kiln? Right. You can't do any of this uh, investigation from space without actually knowing what's going on on the ground. So they start with people who work at non-governmental organizations on the ground or organizations like the UN who have been in these regions and actually, you know, found these instances of forced labor in person. And then they use those examples to generalize into space and look for those signs. But then once they have those, they also have to go back to the ground and say, you know, was that ship just having a bad day or were they doing something bad? So it's really all about the ground, even though we're doing it from space. And then it's also to some extent about machine learning and AI, because there's a lot of ground to cover. How, How is machine learning involved in finding these different sites? The biggest example we have right now goes back to those brick kilns because they are so easily identifiable researchers at the University of Nottingham, which runs an organization called the Rights Lab, have taught a machine learning algorithm to recognize these brick kilns and then had it search through an example area to see if it can pick out brick kilns on its own without input from people. And it's doing that to a fairly high degree of accuracy, but it's still kind of in its its nascent stages. And so anything that is recognizable and distinct like a kiln or um, you know unusual shipping activity, researchers can train an artificial intelligence algorithm to recognize that kind of strange activity. What happens next? Say they see it from space, they check and say, yeah, that did happen or that kiln is there. How is this information being used to prevent these things from happening or stop them? Right. That's a good question because you could do all of this analysis and then just kind of let it sit in a white paper if you wanted. But what 
the researchers, especially at the Wrights Lab, are trying to do is pass that information to the NGOs on the ground. And then also to a policy organization the United Nations has called Delta 8.7, which brings together these artificial intelligence experts and satellite experts and policymakers to try to actually do something about it so the information doesn't just sit on someone's computer. Very interesting. That actually brings up something that's happening relatively soon. And the UN is holding a meeting to try to bring all these different groups together to kind of improve on this. The UN's think tank um, is holding a conference called Code 8.7 on February 19th and 20th that is bringing together all these people who know a lot about the things they know about, like slavery or like artificial intelligence, but who maybe don't know about each other's realms of expertise to try to get the people who own the satellites to understand what slavery looks like and to get the people who understand what slavery looks like to understand how it looks from a satellite um, and try to just fuse these technologies into something that is useful on the ground. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Sarah Scholes is a freelance science journalist based in Denver. You can find a link to her article at sciencemag.org slash podcast. Next up, we have books editor Valerie Thompson speaking with author Judy Grizel about her work, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. Welcome back to the book segment of the Science Podcast. I'm Valerie Thompson, the book review editor here at Science. Today, our guest is neuroscientist Judy Grizel, who's here to discuss her new book, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. Judy, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Valerie. So let's get started. The book project was more than a professional endeavor for you. It was also pretty personal. Um, so before we dive into the book itself, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with addiction? Sure. My first experience with intoxication completely altered my life's trajectory. I was 13 and felt like the large amount of alcohol I consumed somehow filled the void. Some people, I think, say it's like a hole in the soul but it made me feel comfortable with myself and capable of handling the pain of living or of growing up or being an adolescent. And so for about the next 10 years or so, I never said no to a single um, opportunity to change the way I felt. Of course, eventually from that, I was uh, pretty hopeless and also homeless and had lost quite a lot. But I ended up in treatment at 23, and when I learned about the disease model and that it was best treated with abstinence, which didn't sound great to me, I figured that diseases could be cured, so I got right on it. It's funny, um, most addicts, and I was like most, I guess, really are so determined that there must be a way to keep using, and that's, I think, why we drive ourselves into the ground. Well, obviously, there's no single lever, but you do study beta endorphin, and that has been linked with alcohol addiction. So how does that work? I should go back to my original plan, though, and how naive I was, because I thought, well, it's a disease. I'll just find the the single lever or so that caused the disease, and then I'll fix that. And what I learned in graduate school and a postdoc and years of researching in the field is that there are many, many such levers. One that I have knowledge about and is a focus of my particular research is beta endorphin. But again, it's just one of many factors. And beta endorphin levels are normally distributed in a population. So there's people who have naturally high and naturally low levels. And that happens to be correlated with your inherited risk. So if you have a lot of alcoholics in your family, you're more likely to have low levels. And if you have none in your family, you're more likely to have high levels. What's really interesting to me about that is that alcohol stimulates the synthesis and the release of beta endorphin. And it especially does this in people who have the high risk. So they start out lower, but they can really effectively self-medicate that deficiency by drinking. And so I assume that one of these people who drinks or gets their first or you know, early experience with alcohol would think it's fantastic because suddenly they feel, you know, full of endorphin, not that they recognize that's the cause. Whereas for somebody with low risk, it probably doesn't have a big influence on that pathway. 
so we're kind of at a more granular level here, but there's also these kind of higher level societal trends. So um, for example, you described this relationship between the 60s and anti-anxiety drugs. And so now we're in the midst of the opioid epidemic. How does this fit with this view of society and drug use kind of reflecting each other? I think the, um, the main point is that manipulating our neurochemistry to change the way we think and feel and behave is ancient and universal. So there's always going to be something. But it is interesting that the fads kind of come and go. And opiate use has been rising steadily over the past several years, especially among young people. It's worth noting, though, since we just left alcohol, that there's much more alcohol abuse and addiction than opiate abuse and addiction. But anyway, it is, it's rising. And there are many factors, I'm sure, involved in that. But I do think possibly we're attempting to medicate suffering because opiates are really an antidote to suffering. They're not an antidote to pain as much as they are caring about the pain. And I think that we're both suffering individually, but also certainly maybe more aware of the suffering of others. And that is painful to look at. So I wonder whether or not um, we're in a time and place where this is going up so high that we don't, the amount of suffering we experience or we perceive is um, just driving a need to escape. You talk about something I've never heard of before in your book, anti-opiates. Can you talk about what those are and how more generally the brain and the body compensate for the effects of drugs? Sure. The kind of core of my argument is that the brain adapts to any drug that changes its feeling state or the way we feel by producing the opposite effect. So stimulants regularly used make us lethargic and sedatives regularly used make us tense and anxious and opiates regularly used make us um, suffer. Pain is really critical to our survival and therefore it's mediated by a rich neurobiology. There are many circuits and neurochemicals involved in modulating pain. Some of these block pain, like endorphins, as we just talked about, but others, maybe less well known, enhance pain. That's because it's important to our survival both to be able to ignore pain and to experience it when it's time to attend to the pain. So Early studies, even in 1980, for instance, Hahn showed that if you took brain extract from morphine-tolerant animals, it caused an immediate tolerance in other animals that were otherwise naive. And uh, taking cerebral spinal fluid from morphine-dependent rats caused abstinence in other rats. So the scientists were arguing that something was produced by the brain to produce the opposite effect. There's whole dozens, really, of anti-opiates that are proposed to be upregulated or increased in response to chronic opiate exposure. And the consequences of those chemicals would be to produce the opposite effect. So instead of constipation, they might mediate diarrhea, or instead of blocking pain, they might enhance it. How does a person who's withdrawing from the drug, like what is their experience then when they when these chemicals are, are being released? The experience of withdrawing from any drug is always the exact opposite of the acute effects of the drug. Understanding what causes that experience depends on the particular drug we're discussing. But in the case of opiates, some of that experience of suffering, of not being able to sleep, of being restless, of feeling so sick, is likely caused by the release of anti-opiate compounds. Eric Wordelak did this study in the 1990s, and he had rats who were releasing opiates to deal with what they expected to be a, a stressful situation. And then there was a signal that indicated that the stressful situation went away. And as soon as that happened, they release something that completely blocked morphine's effects. So we can see that the body is capable of enhancing and attenuating our pain states kind of on a dime. And so that requires neurochemicals. How does that jive with like how we treat addictions now? Is that 
knowing that the brain has all these compensatory mechanisms, how should we be treating addictive states? So in general, those compensatory mechanisms have to take some time to go away because they're in place in order to help us maintain homeostasis. So if we, like I'm completely addicted to caffeine, if I wake up in the morning and uh, try to have a conversation before I have coffee, I can't really put a sentence together. So if I wanted to withdraw from that dependence, I would probably take days and maybe weeks to get back to a normal state where I could wake up without caffeine. So I think part of it is giving a person time and space away from their drugs so that they could be detoxified in a way that the acute phase of withdrawal and craving was you know, not so intense. But also it might be worth figuring out ways to facilitate that adaptation back to a naive state. There is with opiates a way to do that, and everybody's probably heard of Narcan, which is a drug that's used to treat overdoses, but it would be possible to speed up the return to a naive brain state by giving huge doses of Narcan. Of course, nobody who's an addict wants to experience that effect because it will make them, they don't want to experience Narcan because it will make them go into withdrawal. But you could, and people do occasionally, get anesthetized during that acute withdrawal phase. So they spend two or three days kind of knocked out with Narcan on board, which helps bring the brain state back to a baseline, a a naive baseline, and then they're not experiencing withdrawal when they wake up. Of course, they recognize that state and they realize they could also go get high. So often it results in a quick relapse. Um, So you mentioned kind of the difficulties of getting adolescents in particular to avoid experimenting with drugs. How does your research and your own experience as an addict kind of inform your, how you talk to the young people in your life about drugs? Well, you know, people say they'll do what you do, not what you say. So I feel a little tentative to be saying too much because of course I'm not a great example of this. But I have tried to talk to my students and my own children about this particularly sensitive period of brain development, adolescent brain development, when the behaviors that they engage in can produce these lasting, much more lasting changes in the brain. So for instance, I tried to say to my own kids, if you could avoid using any addictive substance until you were 23, which I thought was a good time, then I will buy you a plane ticket anywhere. And (laughs) I like that negotiation. That's just like, well, I don't think it really works. Um, And I don't know if it works with my students either, but I have, I think, impressed upon some, in some of my communications, some of my students and my some of my children, that um, taking less and taking it later during this adolescent period might enable you to enjoy it more and more casually as an adult. Oh, interesting. So you're not encouraging, you know, like total abstinence. It's kind of a more realistic maybe approach to... Yeah, I'm not against drug use at all. I, I think I've used up my opportunity for it, but I do think that addiction is really devastating to people and their families and their communities. So I think if we can avoid the compensatory processes, and you can do that, especially by not taking a lot and not taking it while you're young, you know, I think it's natural to want to experiment. And I think it's interesting. So based on your research and what we know about how the brain processes addiction, Is there an ideal way to treat addiction? Is there something that we do now that's closest to working or maybe something that we're thinking about doing? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And of course, it's something that many of us care a lot about. There's certainly been a long history of failed strategies. We can see that in our immediate history, but also doctors who've treated alcoholism with heroin. Freud, in fact, recommended cocaine to his friend who was addicted to morphine. Substitution is probably not the best strategy in many cases, but I think it's also important to ask, ideal from whose perspective? So methadone is really cheap and fairly effective, which helps addicts not be so likely to commit crimes, for instance, and or overdose, but it's also a real ball and chain for an addict, so it doesn't increase their freedom from drugs, for instance. 
at ant abuse was used for alcohol addiction, and it's also not very effective. So I think one message, at least from my perspective, is that we need to focus maybe more on the demand rather than on the supply, and that education might have a big role to play in that. I really am especially hopeful that what we learn about how the brain adapts to chronic drug exposure can be something that kind of trickles down to general knowledge. Kind of like when I was a kid, we didn't even wear seatbelts. And now everybody wears a seatbelt. You know, we didn't use sunscreen. And now that's just part of being out on the, in the sun. So I think if we appreciated how great the brain is at adapting and learned ways to mitigate that, prevent intense adaptation by taking less, especially, or maybe not getting so into it as an adolescent, then we might at least have fewer people to treat. Judy, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. That was books editor Valerie Thompson speaking with Judy Grizel, author of Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. I really appreciate all the people who wrote in saying they would be interested in the book reviewer position. We have found someone, so thank you all again for writing us. And it was really heartening to hear how many people listen this far into the show. So amazing. Thank you, guys. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, or you can listen on the science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcast. To place an ad on the show, contact midroll.com. The show is produced by Sarah Crespi and Megan Cantwell and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.